as my title suggests, um, glass half empty, glass half full. Um, can we skip ahead a slide, please? Just quickly, my organisation, Verve Research, I'm obviously a doctoral candidate at the ANU, but I just want to have this opportunity to say a little bit about what we do. Um, my group delves into the relationships between militaries and societies, and we provide that research in support of not only government policy making, um, but for public knowledge as well. Slide. So my presentation today in three parts. First, I want to go over some of the highlights of how Indonesia has responded to COVID-19. I want to talk about what I think the coronavirus's impact has been and what will be on Indonesia's foreign policy and defence policy. And lastly, of course, what does it mean for Australia? Slide. So Indonesia COVID-19, slide please. So my preliminary assessment of how Indonesia has responded to COVID-19 really depends on your perspective. Is it glass half empty, glass half full? Well, as my presentation will show today, it really depends on what part of that response you focus on. But to set Indonesia's experience of COVID-19 in a proper context, I'd like to highlight three factors, um, risk factors, aggregating factors of how Indonesia must operate in terms of dealing with this virus. So just to update some of the stats from the slide, as of today, there are 11,587, sorry, not active, but confirmed cases, and just under 2,000 recovered and 865 deaths, which is a mortality rate of about 7%. So with those numbers, of course, we're not necessarily sure that they are reflective of the entire picture in Indonesia. But what we do know is that the Indonesian government and society must combat this virus in a context of 260, if not 270 billion people, of which 10% of them are officially under the poverty line. That's the entire population of Australia. Now, that makes social distancing extremely challenging, particularly when people have to work, when they can't rely on government safety nets. And with a very challenging public health system, it means that access to medical care is always even. And some government protections, uh, say about 200 dies result of this. Um, another factor to highlight about Indonesia is that although it is one considers a hyper-connected country, um, that's the country that we viral news and disinformation campaigns which can undermine a lot of the government's efforts. Right. So I'm going to check a little bit of noise. Is that from anyone on the phone? It's a bit mute because quite a lot of stuff is coming in from the background. It's not from my side. No, I think it's for, uh, from participants. Okay, I just wanted to double check. So Flavia, are we good to keep going? Okay. Okay, um, so there I'm going to start by highlighting some of the responses at three levels. So first I'm going to start with the national level. So we've got President Jokowi there at one of the new medical facilities. Slide. So what I'd like to do is rather than give you an exhaustive list of how the national government has responded to COVID, I just want to highlight some certain factors, certain decisions that I think have characterized some of the government's response. So my prelim assessment is that thus far, the Indonesian central government has had a rather slowish and conservative response. Unlike other governments, its first response was to enact travel restrictions. But I think since then, a lot of the challenges around the Jokowi administration's responses have been about information, that there has been uh, a lot of restriction and a lot of concern about how transparent the government has been. Um, the first positive results were only released on the 2nd of March. Um, just to give that in context, Australia's first confirmed case of coronavirus in the, was on the 25th of January. There were also a high rate of burials in Jakarta earlier this year when compared with data from previous years that started raising suspicions as well. And additionally, um, there were a lot of medical experts globally who started questioning Indonesia's lack of results. People traveling from Indonesia or through Indonesia were getting sick um, in other countries. So unfortunately, the government ended up admitting that it withheld information. Um, and some of the reason for that was in order to be able to hold back some anxiety and panic in the population. But I think one of the things to observe, obviously, in those kinds of conditions is that it can be very dangerous for eroding public trust in political institutions as well. Slide. Another thing I want to highlight in the government's response was some confusing messaging from some members of the cabinet. 
um, the health minister actually said it would be the power of prayer and not necessarily face masks that would protect the population. And indeed, um, the coordinating minister for maritime affairs and investments, Luhuk Bunjaitan, also talked about the uh, warmer weather in Indonesia as helping the country beat the virus, which has been debunked by the WHO. So as I said, unfortunately, there's been a balance um, that the government has needed to strike between maintaining economic activity and preventing panic. But I think there've been some certain missteps in trying to give clarity to the Indonesian people about what's going on. Part of that has also been the challenge in the government's response has been the low levels of testing. Um, I've got 25 um, people per million tested there. That's for the um, polymerase chain reaction tests. The level is slightly higher for rapid tests, 184 tests per million, but that's still relatively no, low for the number of um, the Indonesian people. And those rapid tests are more readily available to people who have particular connections, um, elite families, and of course, you know, security services. But if you're an average person and you don't quite fit the criteria in order to be able to get a rapid test, let alone a PCR test, um, then it can be very challenging. So that's, I think, part of the response. Um, I don't want to be completely down on the national government. They did introduce a stimulus package. Um, there were more tests that were ordered. There was a hospital that was built within four weeks on Galang Island um, in order to be able to deal with returnees from overseas. But overall, I'm just highlighting some of what has been characterizing the national level response slide. Now let's go down a level and look at the provincial level responses. And I think this is the level that it's often missed in the media. Now I would characterize that thus far as being a bit bolder, but across 34 provinces, the responses obviously be quite variable. So what I wanna do here is again, just highlight a couple of the provincial responses to give you an idea of how that might be different from the national level government as well. Now, part of the problem has been that as the provincial gov level governments have gone to act, they've sometimes been stifled by the central government as well. So there's a particular case where in Jakarta, um, the governor Anis Baswedan enacted certain restrictions on public transport and the federal level transportation ministry actually nullified um, that decision as well. So there's just indicative of the tension between the center and the periphery that is playing out in this current pandemic in Indonesia's response as well. Now, of course, because the conditions in each of the provinces differ, not only in terms of population density, but in terms of resources, each governor, mayor's regions have had to act according to their circumstances. Some of them have shut schools early, some of them has enacted different levels of lockdown. Papua province, all the way in the east, as you can see there on the side, there are seven lung specialists for 3.4 million people. Um, and you can imagine what would happen if a couple of those got sick um, and 60 ventilators. So obviously, um, the governor of Popperov has to, had to act in accordance with the conditions in his, in his province slide. Now to let's go a little bit deeper in terms of provincial level responses in Jakarta, it's the epicenter of what has been um, the, the inflicted um, effects of coronavirus. At the moment, there's actually 4,539 confirmed cases, 632 recovered and 408 deaths. So it's just under half of the national total. And the governor, Anis Baswedan, who was actually once a Jokowi political ally, has been criticizing the government, saying this government has acted with no sense of emergency. In order to be able to apply for certain kinds of large scale social restriction measures, the provincial governments actually have to apply to the federal government to ask for permission to do things in their own province, which some have criticized has been an unnecessary amount of red tape. So nevertheless, Anis Baswedan applied for strict lockdown measures on the 10th of April, and was granted those measures the very next day. So that's why there's been that two week lockdown period. Um, so, you know, to some degree, those have been variable as well. The military and police have helped out with certain checkpoints throughout the city in order to be able to make sure that those measures are actually being respected. But West Java, which is the third uh, largest uh, number of cases in the country, they've got currently 1,252 cases and only 86 deaths. Um, the governor there, Ridwan Kamil, has asked as well to implement large-scale social restrictions with the high population density, about 10% of overall cases, um, they've had to act swiftly as well in order to be able to stop the spread. And again, there's been variable results. Um, Kamil has said to some degree they have flattened the curve, but I read this morning that some of the restriction um, restrictions have probably there have been three cases of people infected on public transport as well. So they're now calling for maybe a shutdown on one of the railway links between Bogor and um, 
Jakarta as well. So we'll see what happens. It's just a, a completely changing situation day by day. But again, just some of the responses at the provincial level where they've had to go a little bit harder. Slide. To get an idea of how the coronavirus has actually impacted Indonesia province by province, I've just got a quick snapshot there of the top 10 of most affected. You can see obviously Jakarta is the largest, East Java, West Java, Central Java. So Java, this is a very Java centric um, virus thus far, but South Sulawesi, again, there is a very loose correlation there between population density, uh, absolute population numbers, and the number of people infected. But if you look down to the ninth most affected province, Papua, Papua is about the 20th most populated province in Indonesia, but yet it's the ninth most affected. And obviously a province like Bali with its high numbers of tourism, um, that is another factor that accounts for its larger numbers than its population as well. All right, slide. Now let's go one level down. So we've gone national level, we've gone provincial level. Now let's look at civil society. And again, I think Bar from an excellent article in The Diplomat recently, this is another area that has been somewhat overlooked. And I would characterize that thus far as innovative. Of course, to be realistic, yes, there have been um, some negative occurrences that have happened uh, at the civil society level as well. Um, that has been the case that people have inflated the price of face masks when they've been scarce. There's been panic buying. There's been defiance of social distancing measures as well. But I just, again, want to highlight a couple of things that I might think might be missed when people think about how Indonesia is responding to COVID-19. So the universities have come together and put their research to you know, good use towards the virus. They've developed disinfection booths, um, even a robot medical assistant that can, can check patients from a distance. Um, slide. There's been even a case in North Sumatra where students actually downloaded uh, the ingredients for hand sanitizer from the WHO website and they said they were going to take public safety into their own hands. They weren't gonna wait for the government. And when they actually made up this big batch of hand sanitizers, hand sanitizer, they went around to local people, giving them a dollop, truck drivers, uh, food vendors and whatnot. So again, just that kind of um, resourcefulness and the initiative at the civil society level. Um, what you're looking there actually is a, a couple of ghosts. This is again, another uh, example of great creativity that happens in the archipelago. And um, these are known as pochong. And um, there's a whole uh, backstory that goes with them. But in, in short, this was a village in Java where people dressed up as pochong uh, to dissuade people from le leaving their houses. Um, this was, I guess, um, a lockdown measure um, by local youth groups. Um, while people were curious and wanted to come out and see them, um, some residents were actually scared because they were reminded um, of death by these ghosts. So whatever it takes, basically, in Indonesia. But I thought I'd point that out. So slide. Of course, um, Indonesia's large population, as I talked about earlier, is an aggravating factor, um, a risk factor, but I think can also actually be an asset. Um, a lot of the population has been retasked to manufacturing face masks. Um, a lot of the civil society groups have mobilized in order to be able to help distribute food, distribute aid, medical equipment, hand sanitizers. Some of these organizations include the Jakarta and Urban Poor, the Indonesian Conference on Religion and Peace, of course, it includes women's groups, civil society groups like students as well. Um, celebrities have raised money for medical equipment. So again, just these other little pockets of the response, the entire um, whole of nation response, I suppose, um, to this virus is, is much more complicated than just the JACO administration. And of course, already having an established network of delivery services like Grab and Gojek further enables the, the Indonesian community's ability to be able to survive these kinds of lockdowns as well. Just quickly, I also talked about social media earlier as being a risk factor for misinformation campaigns. And I, you know, myself, I've seen on WhatsApp uh, lots of myths going around. If you drink hot water and lemon, it'll kill the virus. If you, you know, do this or do that, eat garlic and stuff. Um, so that's obviously a risk. But I think one of the benefits of having social media is the high levels of penetration throughout the archipelago. Here are some useful figures. 88% of Indonesians use YouTube, 84% use WhatsApp, 82% use Facebook and 79% use Instagram. So that connectedness again within a hyper-connected society is helping keep Indonesians, um, their sense of morale up. During Easter, Christian Indonesians held church services via social media. And now because it's Ramadan, and people are using uh, social media to book a puasa or open fast um, because they're not allowed to go visit their loved ones as well. So I guess slide. 
Okay, so we talked about the three levels, the national level response, the provincial level response, civil society response. Now, what does this mean, this virus, for the way in which Indonesia is now going to behave as an international actor? Slide. So the first thing's first, I don't have it up there, but of course the primary response for the Indonesian foreign ministry has been, able, has been to protect uh, Indonesians abroad. So that's been their primary focus to look after domestic workers, laborers, uh, cruise uh, ship staff, um, students as well in places like China. So making sure that those citizens are looked after, they have evacuation plans and assistance. Um, as of the 1st of May, so a few days ago, 654 uh, confirmed cases of Indonesians with coronavirus um, have been found in 31 different countries. So you can see that Kemlu has their work cut out for them. Um, and it's certainly a time for strong cooperation with countries like India, Saudi Arabia and Malaysia, where there are large numbers of um, Indonesians working there as well. So that's Kemlu's primary focus. Now, looking more broadly, I think coronavirus has going, is going to have um, some very long-term effects in some of Indonesia's most bi important bilateral relationships. And of course, the first of those is China. Um, Indonesia will continue to have an ambivalent relationship with China. And I say ambivalent because for Indonesia, under the Jokowi administration, as we know that there's been a desire to boost investment, particularly in infrastructure development, but also now during the second term, human resource development. Now, of course, China is an important source of that. But at the same time, relations, as we know, have been strained with China. During December and January, 63 Chinese vessels were entering and exiting Indonesia's EEZ. And that was a source of great tension that received a lot of media coverage domestically as well. So there is perennially this give and take relationship with China. Of course, um, there's been a lot of talk about China as a source of coronavirus, but then also China as a source for some of the relief. Um, an Indonesian Air Force aircraft traveled to China in March in order to be able to take delivery of extra personal protection equipment. So again, there's going to be this ambivalent relationship, I think, moving forward that might be further complicated um, by the virus and the ways in which China is responding to a lot of the fallout about being seen as irresponsibly um, holding, withholding information at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, looking at broader relations across the Indo-Pacific, I think Indonesia's relationship with the United States going forward will be largely predicated on the extent to which the United States can and will engage with the Indo-Pacific. Um, we know that the United States is severely affected by the coronavirus, so how it recovers economically, even looking in terms of its naval presence throughout. Um, we all know the incident that happened recently with Captain Crozier um, and the US naval ship uh, Theodore Roosevelt that was off Guam. Um, I don't know what that will mean for future US deployments around the region, but I imagine that there will be some changes moving forward. So I think Indonesia's relationship with the US um, will be determined by that broader involvement and the levels of engagement that the US can sustain in the Indo-Pacific. In terms of India, um, my good friend Evan Laksmana wrote a uh, very thorough CSIS Indonesia commentary recently, and he said that you can't observe a lockdown with questionable legitimacy of your domestic security forces. And of course, he's talking about there the Indian police. Save for some particularly egregious cases, for the most part, Indonesia's security forces, particularly the military, enjoys uh, legitimacy amongst the Indonesian population. And while Indonesia and India have different civil military settings, I think this might be one of those entry points for a conversation about engagement with Muslim communities in India going forward. And that's just one area of the growing bilateral relationship between India and Indonesia as well. Um, next slide. Okay, in terms of Indonesia's broader foreign policy settings, um, there's been an opportunity here, I think, for Indonesia to further reinvigorate its identity as an advocate for multilateral institutions. Um, it's one of six countries that put together a UN General Assembly resolution um, asking for greater exchange of information and to support the WHO. So that bodes well for future support of multilateralism. Um, as my other good friend, Andrew Mantong from CSIS Indonesia pointed out in a recent commentary, the ASEAN vision for the Indo-Pacific doesn't contain any provisions for health. So again, here there is opportunity for Indonesia to be able to spearhead talks of cooperation and inf information exchange on issues of regional and public health we can have a forum as well. So, slide. All right, so we'll move on now to defense policy. And there's just a slide there of the military chief, Hadi Chayanto, um, during one of the earthquakes in 2018 in central Sulawesi. Um, 
slide. As is always, as is the case in Indonesia, um, we'll, we'll look at the defence policy in two ways. So we'll just talk about the immediate effects of COVID-19 on defence policy. As is always, when it comes to any kind of disaster, whether it's natural or in this case, um, pandemic induced, induced, the military is there as a first responder and it's been mobilised throughout the archipelago. As I mentioned earlier, it's been there to enforce social distancing measures in order to be able to hand out equipment, um, to man checkpoints and to help with hospitals as well. And the irony is, as I want to point out at times like this, nobody is criticising Indonesia's land-based strategic culture. We know Indonesia is trying to build up a greater sense of its maritime assets, and I'll come to that in a second. But in the immediate sense, we are supportive of the fact, as very much Indonesia is, that its army is there for its people. And that is a virtue of history and a virtue of necessity as well. Um, the Air Force has also received um, some prominence during this time, having moved not only people around the archipelago and evacuating people, but also be able to move assets. I didn't include a diagram, but I'll send it around of the number of sorties that the Indonesian Air Force has done throughout the archipelago. And of course, lastly, the Indonesian military's um, boost has been in the form of Lieutenant General Donny Manado's appointment as the head of the coronavirus uh, task force response team. He is also the head of the National Disaster Mitigation Agency. So we're currently three-star general serving in that agency. So again, reinforces that perception of military over civilian competence, which we can get to a little bit more in the Q&A slide. Um, so looking now at the long-term effects of coronavirus on defence policy, um, I want to start with defence spending. Um, you can see there in the graph by DIO that there's been a very modest set of increases to the defence budget since 2009. 2018 says that it's about $7 billion. The budget allocation for 2020 was actually 10 billion US dollars. Now, the problem with that is that allocation is predicated on continued levels of GDP growth. Now, unfortunately, like all the economies globally, Indonesia's economic growth um, levels will have to be revised. Um, so there might be some restrictions to the third and final phase of the minimum essential force, which is the name of the military modernization program. Jokowi has announced that he wants greater reliance on the domestic arms industry. That is an old policy of his, but that has received renewed attention in recent months due to what will be the delay of international arms um, uh, supplies over the uh, orders uh, in the coming years as well. So Indonesia's response again is to double down on that defense, domestic defense industry policy. Now, oh sorry, slide as well. Um, now that might have severe implications for the way in which it can build up its maritime resources. Having said that, Indonesia has a domestic shipbuilding industry. It's also looking to develop its own um, domestic UAV as well but there might be some other bits of information, some skill sets that might be constrained due to a lack of being able to go to places like South Korea, where a lot of their submarine technology comes from as well. So we'll see what that means going forward, but this might be a period of, of slight disruption to that. The other restrictions that I think coronavirus will have on defense policy in Indonesia, of course, are defense diplomacy. There will be, a, well, there has been a cutback, obviously, of the number of military officers that are able to travel, not only to staff colleges, but to participate in uh, defense activities. And so we may see disruption in the number of people to people links that are created during these times. Again, in terms of absolute numbers, this may not be a huge effect, but it's something for us to bear in mind. In what ways can we be more creative in maintaining some of our dipl defense diplomacy links in the age of Zoom, for instance. So that is something I think that Indonesia ought to be thinking about as well. Um, and of course, as Indonesia has been investing more and more in its peacekeeping um, presence as well, um, it will have to rethink the way in which its personnel engages uh, in those kinds of missions moving forward with the additional health risks as well. Lastly, in terms of security policy, there have been some excellent uh, short pieces, some commentaries from the Institute for Policy Analysis and Conflict, Sydney Jones's organization. I thoroughly encourage you to read them online. But just quickly, there's been some opportunism on behalf of groups like the Mujahideen Indonesia Timur, who actually sees the coronavirus as an ally against Islam's enemies. So what that means is that some of these groups that had almost had no new recruitment are all of a sudden being um, finding it easier to get people on board because they've got this coronavirus that's on hand with them as well. So there are some interesting implications about the emboldening of conflict, um, of conflict groups and terror groups in Indonesia as a result of the virus. All right, slide. So what does this mean for us? Slide. 
So my takeaway message, I think, for Australia is that we should take the opportunity to engage more, but not appear opportunistic. We should be flexible and realistic. And the same way that I've gone through and analysed Indonesia's response in terms of national, provincial and civil society should be a similar way in which Australia thinks about the ways in which it can support Indonesia's coronavirus and the way in which we can work together. That is that there are things for the federal government to do, there are things for state governments to do, and that there are ties and opportunities for groups within civil society, teachers, doctors, nurses, to be able to engage and exchange information with Indonesian counterparts. Um, in particular, I also want to highlight that this year is the 30th anniversary of the sister state relationship between Western Australia and East Java. East Java is the second most affected state in terms of coronavirus statistics in Indonesia or province in Indonesia. And given Australia's relative, Western Australia's relative success in uh, having community infection go down to almost zero, I think there's a lot for us to have in terms of a conversation. Um, Peter Tinley led a delegation last year to East Java and there was a reciprocal visit. So there is uh, plenty of, I think, good, uh, good uh, goodwill there in order to be able to continue that conversation. But that is one example, I think, of where Australia could try and build that conversation around coronavirus. And of course, with Indonesia working so hard at the multilateral level, um, Australia should certainly be able to support the inclusion and advocacy of public health issues within the ASEAN context, but also be there to provide um, support to other multilateral institutions like the WHO as well. I do want to say I've been a little bit dismayed to read um, the news in certain outlets that shall remain unnamed about the risks of failing states in our region, um, including Indonesia as a result of coronavirus. I think those assessments are far too pessimistic and frankly speaking, they're very unhelpful to building a narrative, a constructive narrative on the way in which Indonesia and Australia can work together in South Pacific. Um, there have been eight cases in PNG, um, confirmed cases, and as we know, confirmed cases are not necessarily indicative of the entire picture, six deaths so far, but certainly looking constructively between Indonesia and Australia as um, cooperation partners for PNG and Timor-Leste is another area forward. And of course, largely, Sorry, lastly, Australia's support to the Indonesian military's delivery of assistance. Yes, it continues to privilege the army's role within society. Yes, it continues to privilege an internal role. It may not be something that gels with our normative ideals of where we think Indonesian civil military relations should go. Too bad. It is what Indonesia has and it is what's worked for Indonesia. And we must work with the Indonesian sets of civil military relations as they are, not necessarily as we hope them to be. And I think that is something that um, is often missed in analyses as well. So slide. So my, my preliminary assessment, as I said at the outset of this presentation, is that the glass is half empty or half full, depending on where you look. I've talked about the response at the national level. It's been a bit sluggish at the beginning, lack of transparency. The provincial level responses have been a little bit bolder, but again, variable province to province. And we are still going to see what a lot of those measures mean in the future. The civil society response has been a little bit more innovative, um, but I think it certainly helps to lift us up out of that very pessimistic doomsday type of media coverage that we saw in March um, and even in April about how Indonesia would descend into hundreds and thousands of deaths. It hasn't happened yet, as not to say that it might not, but I think having a variable levels of analyses um, gives us a richer picture of what's going on in that country. Uh, lastly, in terms of foreign and defense policy, Many of those might be altered for now. There, is, there are opportunities for Indonesia to be um, a multilateral advocate and to have more complex relationships with some of its bilateral um, partners as well. But in terms of defense diplomacy in the immediate, the military is stepping up in order to be able to fill that first responder gap. And there might be some minor constraints to the way in which the military operates overseas um, in years to come. But my overall message today, I wanna hammer this home, when we're trying to look at Indonesia and trying to understand not only what the government is doing, but what the military is doing, it is very important to separate that analysis into levels of national, provincial, district, and even village level as well. And from there, you'll get a much more informative um, and, and much more interesting picture of actually how the country is responding to a complex crisis like a pandemic. Thank you very much. Slide. All right, I look forward to all your questions.
Thank you. Sorry, I was too muted. Thank you very much. Um, Natalie was a fascinating presentation. Um, uh, now, as we move to Q&A, uh, I will go for a, a show of hands and I can go through all the participants in our seminar. So uh, if anyone would like to raise questions, please raise your hand and then you can get them muted and I'm going around. So I see uh, you, Tal, here. Tal, uh, anyone else here? I see you, Tal. So we can start with you, Tal. I'll ask a question too, if I can, of Natalie. It's Ross. Okay, Hi, Ross. I'll go for you, Tal, first, and then I'll move to Ross. Yeah, uh, thank you, Flavia, and, and thank you, Natalie. It's a <clears throat> very fascinating talk, and thank you for giving a very timely and uh, comprehensive introduction on Indonesia's response towards COVID-19 and the in implications of that. And I really like uh, in your talk that you emphasize that we should assess this on different layers. But on the other hand, you also highlight the, the actual the quite close link between the domestic uh, politics and international relations on this particular case. Now, my question as someone who's like a stranger of this topic, uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested to know the religious institutions and their roles uh, in this whole pandemic. Uh, given that Indonesia is the world's uh, most popular uh, you know, Muslim country. And you did mention a few, uh, a few things related, including people creatively using the cultural capital there, uh, trying to persuade local people to do certain things. And that's from the perspective of uh, civil society, which is interesting. But I'm interested in knowing a bit more in this field, especially the religious institutions and which kind of roles are they playing this and what kind of long-term implications that academics may have on the roles of religious institutions in Indonesia because I recently read a few articles including the very interesting one from my colleague uh, David Bushel who is also here and uh, apparently there's uh, uh, increasing influence uh, of uh, religion uh, in Indonesian uh, politics. So uh, I'm very interested in knowing your thoughts on there. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, I'd be happy for David to, to jump in as well after this. Um, my knowledge of the religious institutions aspect of this is more limited, um, but I, it, well, I'm gonna start, it's always hard to generalize when we talk about Indonesia. In some instances, religious institutions have played a positive role in order to be able to spread the message, in order to be able to advise the social restrictive measures. In some instances, I've seen cases where social distancing at certain mosques hasn't been quite observed. So again, it's hard to generalize um, the role. There've been obviously um, instances where um, religious institutions have been able to fill the gap where the state hasn't or the province, provincial government hasn't in terms of supporting low wage workers, um, providing assistance to families where breadwinners are either hospitalized or in isolation due to testing positive. But again, um, this is a very variable picture. David, do you want to add? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, sorry, um, I would move to Ross and then we are going to David. Sure. Okay. Ross, Ross. question. Okay, uh, firstly, thanks Natalie for a, a, a very, very good um, uh, summary of what's happening with this very uh, complex uh, situation. Um, I just wanted to go back to your question about the role that Australia has with Indonesia at the moment. Um, and let me say that certainly at a national level, uh, I'm assuming people can hear me at the moment, can they? I guess they can. Yeah. So uh, at a national level, um, as you would know, our, what can only be described as our outstanding ambassador, Gary Quinlan, which he is, um, has been withdrawn from uh, Indonesia. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we need to understand that wasn't uh, because of any relationship problem with Indonesia, it was just because of Gary's age. He's an old fellow like me, so for his own health. Um, but he's now back in Australia. And in fairness to, I think, like the people from DFAT, uh, I, I'm assuming would have been completely overwhelmed with the task of getting Australians back home uh, over recent weeks. And why I say this is because the only real commentary I've heard about what Australia wants to do with regard to our neighbourhood has been references from the Prime Minister to South Pacific nations. Um, 
all that to me adds up that uh, for good reasons, I guess, that there hasn't really been a lot of focus from Australia at a national level with regard to what's happening in Indonesia. And this gets back to your point, Natalie, with regard to the sister state relationship. And I just really wanted to ask you or any others, uh, unless I'm missing something, um, but it just seems to me at the moment our state um, uh, response to what's happening, particularly in East Java, seems to be extremely benign. Um, I would have thought that um, given the rhetoric that Australia is very good at, you know, more Jakarta, less Geneva, um, building capacity, we need to get more ballast. We're very good at rhetoric about our relationship with Indonesia. And I just, um, whilst we don't want to be opportunistic, I just really wondered whether, um, given its our 30th anniversary, given the size of East Java, uh, whether this actually did present an enormously uh, good, genuine opportunity to demonstrate the level of friendship that we do have with uh, East Java. And as we know, it, it, it's quite deep across all sectors. Um, and to develop some immediate strategies where, uh, you know, as Natalie said, forget the national level, let's go it alone, province to state, whether we could have really been developing a much stronger strategy to, um, to really make a difference at this time, which would then go a long way to cementing this, uh, this important relationship. Um, and I just make a note um, that I was able to read the minutes from a recent meeting last week with, the, uh, uh, with Peter Tilley, the Minister for Asian Engagement with the Business Councils, which I missed. Um, and from those minutes that I've read, there was absolutely no reference that I could see whatsoever to any strategy about really doing something constructive at the moment with, uh, with East Java. So it's a long-winded way of saying, is, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what is your observation of the WA, East Java, sister-state relationship in this current environment, and are we doing enough? Well, I think, I obviously think we could do more, but to be kind to WA and to East Java, I mean, dealing with the immediate effects of coronavirus and state and provincial populations is obviously a priority. Um, yes, there are things that East Java will need going forward and WA, as we're starting to have more bandwidth for thinking about where we're gonna go beyond this, that's the point where we can start thinking about that. But obviously I can imagine that up to this point, our state governments um, and state departments have been seized with dealing with this situation as it is in the state. So. I'd be a little bit more, a little bit more generous, though, as encouraging as you. Hmm. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and um, we would move now to David Butcher, and then we can move to you, Tal, and to Greg Acholi. David? Would you, do you have a question? No, I actually, I didn't have a question, Flavia. Thanks very much. I haven't been actually following that, so I wasn't able to follow up on that, <laughs> no. on that, that question about the religious... Uh, institution so i'll pass it to somebody else actually, actually that's so good thanks david okay so perhaps i'll move um to you Tao again and then go to greg and shirley uh no no uh, sorry Vlavi, i've got to uh, lower my head there sorry about that i've got my <laughs> question now there. sorry about that the question uh greg do you have a question yeah um thanks for that illuminating presentation um I'm, i guess it's a more specific rendering of you Tao's question uh, we've entered Ramadan now. We're moving towards Eid al-Fitri. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of toing and froing regarding whether for Moody, the return to the villages, there should be prohibitions or recommendations or what. What has been the disparity between what we've gotten at the national level from religious authorities, such as the Majeli Sulama Indonesia, and what we've been getting at the provincial level from uh, religious authorities. I know, for example, Aceh has gone its own way in saying certain mosques could stay open, uh, whereas others, uh, where there were centers of infection, would have to be closed. What, what has been the disparity between pro provincial and, um, and national recommendations and, and stipulations with regard to uh, Ramadan and a celebration of Eid al Fitri? Um, that's a question that's actually beyond my knowledge, actually. It's unfortunately, so unless anyone else can answer that, it's one I'll take on notice and look into, Dave. Oh, Greg, thanks. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, so anyone else would like to raise a question or uh, you can have a show of hands. I'm going around to see if anyone else would like to. Uh, I see here Phil Turtle and then Jai Chen next. So Phil, please, you have the word. Oops, you are unmuted. Okay. Um, well, I guess following on a bit from my dear friend and colleague Ross's uh, observations, you know, an area that we've perhaps seen the Australian response not great is in international education and international students. And it may be a little bit off topic, but I wonder if Natalie might uh, reflect upon, you know, how that positions Australia moving forward, because obviously international students and education are a very important part of our economy. Uh, and in terms of building goodwill between countries, there's no better way. And uh, again, just leave that open to Natalie to pack perhaps reflect yeah. on the Australian government's response and, and how we can do better perhaps. That's going to be a tricky one, actually, because I can think of so many, you know, at a personal level, so many good relationships that I've built with um, friends and colleagues from their opportunity to come and study in Australia or Australians' opportunities to go study in Indonesia as well. Um, one of the things I was thinking about um, when I said it's, um, about using civil society in Australia or groups of doctors, um, teachers and um, nurses to create those links as well, I was at a conference in Australia Indonesia youth meeting a couple of years ago in Makassar. And one of the delegates got up and she said, look, I'm, um, I think she was a doctor or advanced medical student. She said, look, um, it's essential for us to be able to create communication networks with colleagues in Australia to be able to help facilitate conversations on sensitive medical topics like sexual health. And it sort of gave me this idea, it's been lingering in my brain for about a year and a half now about the importance of those virtual interfaces for the purposes not only of information exchange and, and relationship building, but in order to be able to tackle perhaps some um, topics of taboo or or to be able to do things like debunk and, pri and privileged scientific explanations of, of certain phenomena. So it's in that spirit um, that I think those virtual links are going to be absolutely essential and using the current alumni networks of Australians that have been to Indonesian universities and Indonesians who have studied in Australia to be able to encourage Indonesian participation in what is now, I understand, an online delivery of university courses and all manner of different permutations of education I think is going to be a step in that direction. Um, it's going to be, you know, we're going to be competing internationally with all sorts of other kinds of online courses and it's not going to necessarily be easy to be able to attract students back to Australia as it was before. Um, so trying to figure out how we can be competitive against, you know, what is now Indonesian studying in Indonesia against all sorts of different institutions globally will be, I think, the challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Natalie. And now we are moving to uh, Jai Chen. You are muted, Jai. All right, okay, yeah, now, yes, all right, I'm okay now, all right. Well, thanks, Natalie, uh, for a very insightful, comprehensive presentation. I wonder whether you can delve more into Indonesia's uh, reaction to the emerging international or Western you know, campaign, so to speak, to hold Beijing accountable for what happened, right? For all this cover up, whatever, and, and also there are quite a few Asian, uh, you know, organizations, NGOs, and if not the governments as well, seeking compensation. Um, you know, you have spoken about the very mixed, ambiguous uh, sentiment that Indonesia has towards Beijing. Uh, but can you, can you actually sort of look look at the issue from from the perspective that I've suggested? Is there anything going in Indonesia that 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 that, that suggests that Indonesia may join Americans and, and Australian government in that direction? And another kind of benign query I have is, you know, you alluding to Chinese donation. I'm not donate. I'm not sure whether the donation or selling whatever in medical equipment and all that. Uh, but so has Taiwan joined the fray by donating, you know, quite, you know, a tiny bit of uh, stuff to Indonesia and other, other, other member states. So how is Indonesia trying to balance these two sort of, you know, rival or, or conflictual regimes in handling all these donations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, in terms of Indonesia's, uh, embrace of what would be seen as a Western campaign. Um, 
I haven't heard anything specifically, but I can imagine that it would be with great caution that Indonesia would fly its flag in that particular camp, unless it was something that was seen to be broader than just a Western campaign of China. I mean, as you rightly, as I, as I emphasized in my presentation, Indonesia is has got no appetite to antagonize China. Um, the issue with the Natuna Islands um, is one of, of central importance to Indonesia insofar as that it affects sovereignty. And Indonesia has interests in holding countries like China accountable when it comes to transparency of public health information, but it is simply not on the same caliber of core interest, vital interest to Indonesia as a matter of territoriality and sovereignty, um, which was an issue that came to light in Indonesia as by virtue of a very strong media focus as well. So unless this particular issue has similar kinds of conditions, um, taps into a vital interest for Indonesia, is not seen to be Western driven, has received the high levels of media scrutiny and, and um, flurry of public debate that something like the Natuna Islands matter did, it's unlikely that Indonesia is going to push back as vociferously as it did with issues like the Natuna Islands. And even then you had variation within the cabinet, within the government about how Indonesia ought to respond um, you know, nationally in, in order to, you know, different ministers saying different things. I would imagine that this kind of campaign would elicit similar kind of variation within that response as well. So it would be a complicated picture, very complicated. But in terms of the second half of your question with China and Taiwan, China is, is, um, is, is, is worlds apart in terms of significance for Indonesia. Indonesia will maintain good diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but ultimately um, China as a pivotal state in the Indo-Pacific um, and as well for Indonesia's national development dictates that it will always be much more important. Uh, sorry, I, I was particularly talking about the virus diplomacy from Taiwan through a donation of medical equipment, facial masks. You know, I was really focused on this particular aspect of the rivalry. In terms of with, Indo with Indonesia in that context? Exactly, how I Indonesia responds. I've seen a lot about um, recognition of Taiwanese um, participation in that, but again, that might just be my lack of, 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 um, of seeing Taiwan in that context, but a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of coverage about the Chinese engagement there. Of course, not all the media is positive about China with regards to coronavirus, but certainly it's been more prominent that I've seen anything with Taiwan. But again, this is something that I can go follow up on. Okay. Thank, you. Um, thank you so much for both of you for the questions. Now we have Time for two last, the two last questions, one from Silvia Lozeva and one from uh, Professor Samina Yasmin. And after these two questions, we'll need to bring our meeting to a closure. Having said that, we can still receive uh, questions for Natalie via email. You can send that to me and I'm happy to forward to our guest speaker and she can later on get back to you. So now we are going to uh, Dr. Silvia Lozeva. I'm trying to unmute her. Yes, you are unmuted. Oh, oh hi, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Natalie, for your wonderful presentation in terms of COVID response to, uh, in terms of uh, defenses, responses, and uh, national and um, local uh, level. I'm uh, particularly interested in the civil society response that you mentioned briefly in your presentation. And I'm just wondering whether this situation of COVID-19 has created a greater sense of global connectedness, despite the fact that it has been uh, rather a lockdown and very much sense of um, perhaps isolation. And um, I'm just curious whether you, you know or you could comment, I guess this is not only unique for Indonesia, but whether this um, civil society can create and maintain and leverage more on that global sense of connectedness through things like social media, through belonging to groups that are perhaps advocating for creative and innovative ways of raising awareness about the impacts and things like uh, you showed um, on that bench, the ghosts, which I thought was very creative. And I'm just wondering if that sense of more connectedness would play any role or possibly play any role in the territoriality and the sense of, um, I guess, uh, belonging, uh, <coughs> a global sense of belonging, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Sylvia. Um, if I were going to do research into it, because it's very early days to sort of say whether this fosters that level of global connectedness um, that Indonesians feel. Uh, 
and it would depend at what stage I think of the pandemic that we're looking at you know thinking yeah. about the pandemic, Ramadan you know in the forefront of people's minds or a sense of belonging to a religious community to their families you know particular places and things like that so um what I would think is that the civil society response so far, if you look at the history of Indonesian civil society response, it's not necessarily one that's gone beyond borders. It's very one, very much one that looks at internal resilience, um, that looks at consolidation of groups within neighborhoods, within communities, you know, amongst the student groups and things like that. Every now and then there are issues that unify Indonesian groups that go beyond those levels. Um, and I'm thinking back to things like the 1997, 98 financial crisis, um, you know, plus a, a sort of a, a set of political conditions that give rise to a greater sense of unity. Some of the protests that we saw last year against the laws that Jokowi was thinking of bringing in, um, so the law revisions that he was thinking of bringing in, that can animate certain sections of society. But again, in so far as like Indonesia's global connectedness, again, that's quite limited in terms of its regional relations, in terms of its relations beyond that. Um, I think I think part of that is a product of Indonesian history. Um, there is a limit, I think, to the extent to which um, Indonesia has a global sense of connectedness with other parts of, for instance, like a Muslim identity. Um, but again, I could be wrong, but that's my sense is that a lot of that civil society response is inward in terms of strengthening those ties and consolidation. Thank you very much, Natalie. And now we are moving to our last question from Professor Samina Yasmin, and then we need to give closure to our seminar. Professor Samina Yasmin, please. Thank you very much, Natalie. A wonderful presentation. I was just wondering one question, which is more like a clarification. The uh, ghosts that you showed, were they ghosts or were they shrouds? Because that some Muslims are buried. So maybe that was the message they were giving. But a more uh, substantive question is about how the Bligi Jamaat uh, had some Indonesian visitors who were caught in India and uh, did the Indian government and Indonesia work out a system of repatriating them uh, and is there any similar uh, targeting of the Bligi Jamaat people in Indonesia because they are the ones who carried most of the at least 30 percent of the COVID-19 virus in India at least so far. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, you're right. That is meant to represent the manner in which Muslims are buried. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of saying that if they haven't been, if the soul hasn't been released after a certain number of days, that's that's the representation. So yes, they're meant to be the shroud, but they are kind of loosely referred to as, as ghosts. Um, in terms of your question about the Tablet communities and repatriation, that's again, more specific than I know in this particular instance, um, but it's certainly something I can go and follow up on. But yes, obviously there were some concerns about the gathering, those particular gatherings in Indonesia as well. So there was some discussion about whether that would go ahead. Thank you very much, Natalie. And uh, before we give closure, if there are any uh, bur burning questions, anyone else would like to ask one last question before we, br we bring our meeting to closure? Just with a show of hands, otherwise we are going to bring our meeting to closure. I'll ask just one very, very short, quick question. Okay, and then we need to give closure. So Rob, yeah. do you have- Oh no, we're just, just touching on what you were saying earlier, just with regard to, um, uh, you know, post COVID-19, Probably, I think it would be fair to say that uh, we would still see, uh, I won't use the word belligerent, but we'll, we'll see a China that's still very keen to expand its interest in the South China Sea. Uh, the ongoing issue with Natuna Islands, to which you referred to, will continue. Um, do you think with, with that environment and given the fact of what's happening with uh, America, do, do you think that this could actually create the environment where um, Australia and Indonesia will obviously see that there is a, even a greater need to build on the currently good and diverse relationships that both countries enjoy at the government-to-government -government level. But this would need to be expanded because it really highlights um, both for Indonesia and Australia that uh, alone we are quite vulnerable, but together, along with perhaps India, um, that we can actually uh, build on this um, block, if you like, uh, in the region. Could you just comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think that's an important part of when we think about the Indo-Pacific more broadly. So I, I would talk about this in the context of the Indo-Pacific and what are the kinds of norms um, that we want to build and what role can Australia play in that alongside countries like India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea and so forth. 
um, and of course with China eventually as well. So it would be, um, pardon me, I think I would, I'd, I advocated in January for India and Indonesia to start helping to develop um, maritime norms as well. But I think Australia, it depends on how the perception of Australia as an effective diplomatic actor or of an actor of particular weight in Indonesia's eyes. Indonesia sees itself as a very important diplomatic actor, sees India as a state of consequence, it sees Japan as well. So it's it's how Indonesia sort of positions itself um, and the extent to which it can align its views with whatever, I guess, emerging normative framework that we have in the region. Um, and of course, the extent to which we are still seen as a very close American ally. If we can differentiate ourselves against the perennial argument about you know how close we are, how much of an independent foreign policy we have. So all the same threads of debate. But I think, of course, there's certainly a role for Australia to play. It's one of those of making sure we have a very sober assessment of how, of understanding how we are seen by the region as well, and not necessarily having any sense of um, power or potency by virtue of having been an American ally, but being very realistic about what our contribution is and what the limits of that contribution are. Yeah, good, 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 good observation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Natalie. And uh, now uh, we will need to bring our meeting to closure. Uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining our conversation this afternoon. And um, thank you very much, Natalie, for your brilliant presentation, for enlightening us about the situation in Indonesia with the current COVID crisis. And uh, just a kind note, next week we are going to have Dr. David Mickler et al. So is a presentation by Dr. David Mickler, but based on a joint paper. So next week they will be discussing uh, Africa and uh, migration in Australia. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us today. And um, I hope everyone have a fantastic afternoon and, and please keep tuned for the next seminars. Thank you very much. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you, Flavia. Thank you.